Did I get to keep one of the chairs? No? All right. <laughs> All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, great to be here. My name is Alex Candelo, and I am the Director of Algorithms, Performance, and Tools at d -Wade Systems. My team is responsible for the Ocean open source tools, as well as the hybrid solvers that people use to solve practical problems using our system. I'm really excited to be here to give this talk because what I'm going to be talking about today is can your business problem be solved by hybrid? Or how do you pick a good problem to be used to be solved on our systems? And to me, this is really the fun part. This is, there's lots of cool aspects of quantum computing. There's building the hardware, there's putting together the teams, there's working with customers, there's the sales. But to me, the bread and butter and really fun part that I get excited about is taking business problems, combining them with coffee and effort, and ultimately turning that into something that can be solved on a hybrid solver. So one of the most common questions I get asked at a place like this when I'm talking to y'all is can hybrid quantum computing help me solve my problem? And almost certainly, if you ask me that question out there or you ask anybody at D-Wave, we're going to say yes. Of course we are. We're heavily incentivized to say yes for all the reasons you can imagine. But also, it actually is true that our abstraction layers in our hybrid solvers are so general and optimization problems show up so often in business that very, very often the answer is, in fact, yes. There are a couple... Uh, Exceptions, though, well, you know, a couple caveats I want to toss on there. So the first thing that you will need to know in order to determine whether hybrid can help you solve your problem is, is there an optimization step? So the good news here is that almost always in a business problem, there is something to be optimized. There is some problem that you have that you are looking for a high quality, optimal, say, solution for. But if you don't have an optimization step, it's kind of hard to imagine how we might fit into that picture. The second thing, and this actually is a more common issue, is that you need to have the data. Sometimes when I'm talking to customers, the real problem that they have actually is that they don't have the data to support their application. So this might be something like, I want to make my factory run better. And we'll ask questions like, oh, OK, so where are the current bottlenecks in your factory? And they'll say something like, well, I don't really know. And so in that context, like. If you have the right data, if you have the right telemetry in your factory, we might be able to work on that optimization, but you need to have that sort of data in place. Now, it is absolutely the case that you could work with D-Wave, with our launch program, or with others to help determine what sorts of data you might need, but having that data is something that you need to ultimately solve problems. And the last place that this can kind of go wrong is that sometimes the problem is, you know, what we like to say is too easy. There is an optimization step, but it's trivial or might be better solved by another solver. This is absolutely a thing that happens. You know, the hybrid solver is very general, and one of the reasons that we do hybrid solving, we combine classical and quantum resources together, is because it gives us the best of both worlds, and we are robust to this. We have sort of all the benefits of classical solvers as well as the benefits of quantum. But sometimes the optimization step really is just you have a list of numbers and you want the largest one. If that's your optimization step, that's an important step potentially to your business, perhaps not something that a hybrid solver you need to, you need to uh, bring in the power of quantum for. OK, so let's assume, though, that you have an optimization problem, you have the data, and that optimization problem isn't trivial. When I think about solving problems, I like to think of them going through five steps. So the first step is you need to have a business problem. You need to be able to state you know, in words what's the problem you want to solve. The second step is taking that business problem, which often comes in the form of, I'd like to make more money, uh, and turn that into something like a technical specification. I have n different uh, packages I need to ship. I have these different number of containers. I have two trucks, three trains, and four ships to do it. And I want to do it under a budget of this. That's sort of technical details that actually give form and function and framing to your overall problem. Having gotten a set of technical details, sort of the, the shape of the problem, the next step is to create a mathematical formulation of the optimization problem you want to solve. This is often the most difficult step, and this is really where D-Wave's launch program really, really shines, is helping you turn that set of technical specifications into a mathematical optimization uh, formulation. Nonetheless, even uh, we've seen plenty of customers make this step themselves. There's lots of amazing documentation on Leap. I'd really encourage you to check it out uh, to, to do this step yourself. But if you need a little bit of help, here's where the launch program comes in. Having now created that mathematical formulation, it's pretty much downhill from here. 
getting that into a model construction, that is, turning that mathematical formulation into code, is luckily relatively straightforward. And once it's in code, submitting it to the hybrid solver, easy peasy. Um, so really, that's why I want to focus on these first three steps for this talk. Because really, if you can get to that mathematical formulation of an optimization problem, the rest of it's relatively downhill. I also want to call out that these five steps that I've outlined here are, of course, a simplification. There are many, many other steps that go into these sorts of things. Uh, for instance, you know, we talked just now in the last panel about building out a team. We, yesterday, Savant X talked about getting buy-in from the uh, truck drivers. All of these different things are part of getting your business application onto a hybrid solver and in production. But I am going to be taking this slightly more simplified view just for the sake of keeping this talk coherent. And you know, those other topics have been pretty well covered by some of the other folks. OK, so I always find it useful to start with a worked example in the framework that I've been describing. And the worked example that I want to use today is feature selection. This is one of our most common areas of application that we, we hear about from you all. A lot of the th problems that you all have fall under this umbrella, of, the, of course, many don't. Um, to the point that we actually have an AWS marketplace listing, marketplace listing around feature selection that you can just go get more or less off the shelf to help you with your feature selection problems. These problems come in lots of different forms. Actually, I think yesterday, MasterCard uh, cited this as one of the problems that they were interested in. But for today, I'm going to run with a, a, a sort of synthetic example that goes like this. The business problem specification is, as the chief of information security at Business Incorporated, I'm very good with names, um, I need to know what actions are, asso are associated with malicious behavior so that I can identify hostile attacks on my system before they happen. This is an application I've heard of a number of times when I'm sort of out talking to customers. So that, that business application, I think, is relatively clear. You have a sort of clear objective. You have a thing you want to do. But let's jump down to that next level of detail, the technical specification. So in this case, uh, in this example, let's say, we have n different actions a user can take on our system. That might be things like entering my username or password. That might be clicking on the community. That might be submitting a job. That might be filling out a form. All of the different things it can do on, say, my web platform. And I would like to pick k of them so a certain set of them, to monitor closely. Because I want to know, you know that if uh, this sort of cluster of actions happen, I can identify a potentially malicious user. It's also true that many of these actions are correlated. Many of the users who enter their username go on to enter their password. Those two actions are tightly linked. And then finally, I have a database of past users, their actions, and whether or not they were either benign or malicious. So that's that data piece I was talking about. I have sort of a set of information about my users that I can use to construct my problem. So having now had a business problem and a technical specification, we can create a mathematical formulation for this problem. So for some of you who are used to sort of looking at these mathematical formulations in the context of optimization, I hope this is relatively clear. For those of you who don't, don't worry about it. Um, the actual math here isn't very important. But suffice to say, this is basically saying, I want to pick the best features. That's what the uh, sum over negative QI, that's the quality of each feature, times XI, that's a variable that represents each feature, um, subject to uh, adding back in their mutual information, that is to say their overlap. And I want to do that subject to picking exactly K of them. So that's my K features. Again, if the math is a little bit unfun for you, don't worry about it. Um, I also said I'd be focusing on those first three steps, but I do want to mention that for the model construction and the submitting to the hybrid solver steps, we actually have an open source example of this available in Leap right now. You could follow that link or sign up for Leap and check out our set of examples and see how we do this in a nice visual demo. Um, I know the Wi-Fi has been a little bit funny, so uh, you know, uh, good luck with that. But overall, this is something that you could do probably right now or, or, or at home. OK, so I've been talking about a worked example. And so you know, there I've presented it as a fait accompli. Here's how it, here is how it all looks. But I want to talk about a little bit how we derived each of those steps. And I want to do that working backwards from the hybrid solver back to the, pro the business problem. Because ultimately, if you want to use a hybrid solver to solve your business problem, you kind of need to understand what the hybrid solver is doing. So the hybrid solver of choice here, the one that I'm using in this example, is our constrained quadratic model hybrid solver. So this is a hybrid solver. That means it combines both classical and quantum resources. And it's a constrained hybrid solver, which I'll get into what that means in a moment. 
So again, on the right-hand side, there's sort of the mathematical formalism for what a constrained quadratic model solver is. If that's the kind of stuff you like to read, awesome. I hope that's relatively clear. But for everybody else, I want to sort of talk about some of the elements of a constrained quadratic model. The first thing that a constrained quadratic model has is it has a set of variables. Variables in the context of a business application is code for decisions. I want to go left or right. I want to load that truck or use that train. I want to fold my protein in this way or that way. Our variables on our constrained quadratic model solver come in a couple different flavors. They can be binary. That's a yes, no decision. Left, right, red, blue. They could be integer. I want to put 15 boxes in that container, or maybe I want to put 17. Or they could be continuous. I want to be 3.726 meters away from the wall in order to accommodate enough airflow to keep my server room ventilated. These are the decisions that are, these are the choices that you are asking the hybrid solver to make for your business problem. And most decisions can be actually mapped to one of these three, one of these three areas with a, at least a little bit of fiddling. The second thing that your constrained quadratic model might have, um, it's constrained is in the name, but it's not actually required, is a set of constraints. These define the boundaries on what are acceptable solutions to your problem. If I'm trying to load a shipping container and the constrained quadratic model solver returns a solution that has a box halfway through a wall, that's not a valid solution. If I want to do uh, feature selection and I wanted to pick my K uh, actions to follow and you give me K plus one, it hasn't worked. These constraints are hard limits on what's called the feasible region of the solution space. And this is really important and these show up all the time in practical applications and that's in fact why we built the constrained quadratic model solver in the first place is because these show up all the time. The last thing that uh, constrained, well, constrained quadratic models have, might have some other stuff, but the last thing I want to focus on that a constrained quadratic model might have is quadratic interactions. And that is to say there is some sort of interaction or overlap or aspect in which those decisions inter, uh, interact with each other. So, you know, in the context of, I mentioned this in the context of feature selection, some of those actions are correlated. That's an interaction between them. And those often appear in the context of a constrained quadratic model as quadratic interactions. I want to emphasize again that these things are not required to fit under the constrained quadratic model uh, paradigm. You can have a constrained quadratic model without actually having quadratic interactions, but these are one of those features that we really look for when we're looking for hard problems. I mentioned earlier that sometimes problems are too easy. If they don't have some sort of interaction amongst their variables, very often, uh, or more often, they are in that sort of easier regime. Okay, so let's now map that technical specification onto the constrained quadratic model that I was describing. So you'll remember, and I already touched on this a little bit, but just to sort of make it clear, um, I mentioned in my feature selection problem that I had n different actions that a user can take. And so I can have a binary decision that says I want, for each of those actions that says I want to monitor it. Remember, binary variables are decisions, yes or no. So in my optimization problem, I want to decide, yes, I want to monitor that action, or no, I don't want to monitor that action. I want to pick exactly k of those actions to monitor. So that's a constraint. If I want exactly k of them, then you better give me k. That is a constraint on the problem space. And that many of those actions are correlated. Those variables have interactions. In the parlance of feature selection, we might say that they have high mutual information or they might have correlation. So that feature selection problem, even just starting from the technical specification, fits fairly neatly onto the constrained quadratic model. And those are the sorts of things we look for for, quote, good, uh, good uh, applications for hybrid. I also want to reemphasize, because it is an important point, there is a database of past actions and whether they were benign or malicious. So there is data to work with. There is a problem to be solved. Okay, so having sort of worked backwards, I want to then go one more time through this with a different application to give you, you know, hopefully bring this a little bit clearer and help bring this home again in a different context. So again, I'm going to start with a business problem. This is another business problem that has shown up in a bunch of different places. Um, Johnson Johnson yesterday mentioned this as one of their, uh, one of their applications. Um, as a manager of shipping at Deliver Delivery Limited, I want to pack a fixed number of differently sized boxes using as few shipping containers as possible so that I can minimize shipping costs. Again, classic problem in optimization and logistics. There's a million variations on this. Some of them have notions of routing. Some of them have notions of different size. There's lots and lots of different variations of this problem. I've picked a relatively straightforward one. 
This is also known as 3D bin packing in, in the sort of optimization space. So if we then take a look at our technical specification, this, they tend to go like this. I have up to K shipping containers available. So whether I'm gonna use each shipping container can be represented by a binary variable. That is a decision, yes or no, that I can map into my constrained quadratic model. I have N boxes to put in those shipping containers. Box I being in container J is represented by a binary variable. So I have a decision to put each box into each container, yes or no. Each shipping container is 40 feet by eight feet by eight feet. So the location of each box within that space can be represented using three continuous variables in the X, Y, and Z uh, axes. So we have all of our variables. You, know, you can see that there's decisions to be made. The boxes all have to be within the bounds of the container. That's a constraint. I actually mentioned that as an example before. You can't have a box halfway out of a, halfway out of a container. And the above constraint only applies to boxes within the given container. This is an interaction between the container variables and the box location variables. And this is one of those places that, like, really, the, this, there's a subtlety here that's really important. So I mentioned before that I have a, a binary decision of which box to put in which container, and I have another set of decisions, which is where to put them. Those decisions only turn on when the box is in that container. I don't, I don't want to think about the variables otherwise. And that's where this sort of quadratic interaction is. That's where, in many cases, the difficulty of this problem starts to appear, and that's why we like this 3D bin packing problem. Much like before, I will mention that this 3D bin packing problem is available in Leap. Uh, you can go check it out if you go into Leap, follow that link, or if you have a Leap account, you go and check out our set of open source examples. You can see in all of its glory uh, how exactly we solve this problem and, and you, know, you can see how we, think about how, how we can think about doing it, and you can maybe use that to bootstrap your application. So just to finish up, I want to say that we, these are just two examples and two ways to think about solving these sorts of problems, but I really want to emphasize that point from the first slide. Almost any optimization problem that we have come across fits into this paradigm. If you look at them, you can often come up with these sorts of quad difficult problems have these sorts of quadratic interactions. Almost all problems have constraints, feasible and infeasible solutions, and all, bu all business problems have some sort of decision that you have to make. I also want to call out that we, again, have our launch program if you're interested in getting involved or uh, getting a little bit of help on any of that, but this is a really powerful way to think about solving these sorts of problems. And with that, I think that's the end of my talk. Mer, do you have questions for me, or are we? Yeah, awesome. That's thanks, Alex. Great talk, great talk, Alex. Thanks, yeah, Mary. fantastic. So uh, we've actually got a question here online that uh, I've seen many times. So we've actually, people have asked us this, so I think this will really uh, be beneficial for the audience. Can a user choose the algorithm that's used in the CQM solver for their problem, uh, given the, the variety of algorithms that are options for them? Yeah, so the short answer is no, but the reason for that is that our hybrid solver is in and of itself a portfolio of different algorithms. We combine many, many different algorithms together into one to get you know, classical algorithms, hybrid algorithms, quantum algorithms, et cetera. So we're using a lot of things under the hood, um, but right now uh, it is sort of a, a black box where we throw all of the, the best resources we know how at the problem. Yeah, and it's interesting because uh, you know, when in the design of those hybrid algorithms, we had to be very laser focused about the problem that we were trying to solve with them. So in this case, we're trying to make it really easy for pe people to be able to formulate their business problems and get high quality solutions with minimal parameter tuning and minimal knowledge and expertise in the algorithms themselves. So technically speaking, the hybrid solvers in Leap are specifically to make getting business value on practical applications easy. However, there is a wide community of folks who can contribute to the quantum industry who have a lot of knowledge in algorithms, and where would you send them to, to go to experiment with hybrid workflows? I would absolutely send them to Leap and into our uh, IDE where you have Ocean pre-installed. There's also a uh, open source package in Ocean called D-Wave Hybrid, which is a open source implementation of different hybrid algorithms that you can use to experiment with your own hybrid algorithms. Sometimes this is actually a very smart thing to do because you might be able to incorporate specific knowledge of your problem into that workflow. Or if you're just interested in getting an idea of what these hybrid algorithms look like, this is a great way to get sort of familiar with the way that uh, we think about hybrid algorithms. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I know also um, that we've got, we've got a question here, and it's, it's related to a question I've gotten before, that you know, when people are thinking about cloud compute, Sometimes uh, they're running into circumstances where they're, they're having a tough time with cloud compute, and other times they're, they're having good experiences. And I think a lot of that breaks down to 
you know, the, the portions of their workflows where they're having to move massive amounts of data around versus when they're calling a solver, how do you help people disambiguate those two portions of their problem? Yeah, so this is definitely something that tends to be fairly specific to your application. I mean, you'll know if you're running into one of these bottlenecks. For a lot of, uh, for many, many different applications, it absolutely suffices to use your local system to construct the problem because the specification for the problem is relatively contained. It's only when you try to solve it that you need to use really expensive resources. That said, our Leap platform is, of it, is uh, ultimately available uh, in the cloud, and so if you have if you can run your application from, say, AWS, you have very, very high bandwidth, high, um, high speed connections directly onto our APIs, and so you can really get sort of all the performance you need out of that kind of system. Uh, and then uh, we have a question from the audience here. Could you please elaborate on how the real numbers are represented on the QPU? So the way that we use the QPU in our hybrid algorithms is uh, complex. We don't take, the, I can say that we don't just take the real numbers and sort of embed them directly onto the QPU. We are using the QPU in the context of our hybrid algorithms for certain aspects of the overall workflow to um, unstick certain bottlenecks in the computation and overall to accelerate the workflow. So it's not quite as simple as we just take the problem and we sort of smash it down onto the QPU. It's, it's definitely part of a much more complex flow. Uh, and then another question we've got from the audience here, uh, a little bit more technical, um, is uh, with compliments to your presentation too, so uh, that's really, really nice. Is there any workaround? So if you're working on an application where you feel like you need quadratic terms for the continuous variables, is there a sort of a workaround or a strategy that you use there, or where would you send them? Yeah, there are, and this is absolutely an area that we are focused on right now in Ocean, because um, we know that this has been a bottleneck, so, so definitely we're working on this. I will say there are many ways to take a quadratic uh, expression and create a linear expression from that, and that's something that um, there are some papers that we can show, and there are some workflows out there, but we're working on getting that available in Ocean um, soon. Okay. There's a follow-up question about the L1 norm for those variables. Do you want to handle that on stage or in a follow-up question? That's a great question, but maybe we'll take that as a follow-up. Okay, okay. Uh, so our next question is, um, about how long does each stage of assessing a quantum application take? What can uh, one expect in terms of timeline? That's, yeah, that's, that is the, the, uh, the million dollar question, I suppose, in some cases. Um, I have seen this take anywhere from hours to, to months. I think that one of the main focuses of D-Wave over the last year or so has been driving that process shorter and shorter and shorter. And so much more often, when I first joined D-Wave many years ago, I actually joined the professional services organization, and at that time it was often a six month or nine month process. These days I've seen it very, very often done in a few short uh, sessions with the launch program, so in, in the order of a month uh, is, is fairly common. So, it really can run the gamut, though. Again, it can, be, it can be hours, or it can be sometimes more complicated. Often it is that interaction with the business that ends up being the bottleneck. It's not so much creating the mathematical formulation, but it's then taking that formulation, measuring it, and then testing it in the context of your business, and iterating over that to sort of tune it to your needs. That takes a lot of the time. Yeah, it's interesting. It's actually a lot of the lessons that Alex Candela learned uh, in that professional services organization, helping customers write some of their first uh, programs for quantum processors that became the impetus for our open source Ocean SDK to help people to get, uh, make it easier to get business value using quantum computers. I think we've got time for one last question. Sure. Um, how many quantum use cases would you recommend identifying first? If you identify a few, how do you decide which ones to start on? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it, it really depends on your business needs. We have definitely both had an interaction where a company has, they have one problem. You know, it's, they, this is their problem they would like to use it to solve, and that's enough. You know, that's enough to get started. We've also had the case where a company might have, um, you know, they're interested in, they know they have a lot of bottlenecks, they have a big stable of problems to get started with, and they're interested in testing it on all of them. So I would say there isn't sort of a fixed number that you need to have in hand to get started. I will say that you know, the, the first one is always the hardest. It does get easier after that. And so if you have an opportunity to try a few, you, know, you have an opportunity to learn more about the sort of shape of the problems, to get some experience doing that. And it makes it faster and faster to incorporate hybrid into your business problems going forward. Awesome. Well, hey, that's all the time we've got for Q&A, but it's, it's, kind of, it's a lot of fun being up on stage here yeah. with you. We, we stand really close to each other in the offices at D-Wave. So <laughs> let's thank Alex again for his great presentation. Thanks so Thanks much, everyone. Alex. Thanks, Alex. Awesome.